if you're a music educator and you're, and you're there at that five year mark, that sort of three to five year, like, what am I doing? Is this the rest of my life? Oh Lord, help me like that kind of, which we all feel, but we all feel that. (laughs) Oh, we do. We've been there, right? You are listening to the Music Ed Mentor Podcast, where we help music educators like you build, manage, and grow thriving school music programs and have long and happy careers. I am your host, Elisa Jansen-Jones, and can I just tell you something? One of the smartest things I did in my pre-music teacher life was to work in a music store. Not only did I make lifelong friends, who I'm super excited to go see when I hit the Utah Music Educators Association Conference this February, I also got to know all of the other music teachers in the area where I worked. It was the ultimate networking experience. I learned tons about music instruments and accessories. I got to attend live performances locally, meet professional musicians and celebrities, and basically develop a knowledge of the music industry at large. I cannot stress this enough how important it is if you want to be maximally successful. Not the working at a music store bit necessarily, but the knowledge of the music industry. What advantages does being connected with the industry have? What does the industry even look like these days? Why should we be involved and how can we? What are we missing by not knowing the people and services that are supporting us? And if we decide to one day leave the classroom, where is a good entry point in the industry to look for work? Is that even an option for us as music teachers? Well, to help me answer all of these questions and much, much more, I've brought on an extremely dynamic guest. He's one of my favorite friends, a mentor, educator, music publisher, entrepreneur, marketing guru, and just an outstanding conference presenter, John Mliznak. I first became acquainted with John more than three years ago at the NAFME National Conference in Dallas. At the time, he was on the board for Time, the Council for Technology in Music Education. We're going to talk more about his experience in the episode, so I won't spoil it anymore for you. Trust me, this is good, good, good stuff, and you're going to want to listen to the end. He even had some surprises for me. But first, a big thank you to Smart Music for making this episode happen. With Smart Music, students see which notes and rhythms they played correctly or incorrectly. They see it on the screen in front of them. They receive a performance score and even get to hear their recording back. With a built-in metronome and tuner and the ability to loop sections, it's the most effective practice tool for your students and a big help to your teaching and assessment. Make at-home practice more fun and effective with smart music. This episode is also made possible by NoteFlight, featuring the NoteFlight Marketplace. You probably have already explored the free online notation tool, NoteFlight, but have you ever explored their marketplace? Not only can you purchase sheet music there, you can download and print it too, and even adapt some of it to your own needs. NoteFlight Marketplace also has the ability for you to list and sell your own compositions and arrangements. If you've been looking for a way to share and sell your many, many self-created for you and your program purposes compositions, check out NoteFlight Marketplace. Now, let's talk about the advantages you have by having a strong foundation of knowledge and connections in the music industry with John. Hi there. So I am John Malinzak. I am currently managing director of NoteFlight, a How Learn company, and I've been at NoteFlight for four years. Previously to this, I was director of education for PreSonus Audio in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And previous to that, I was a music teacher, and I blush to say was. I still am a music teacher at, at various college courses, and uh, I've very, um, I feel really lucky and. Uh, also have an interesting, uh, different amount of experiences between teaching music at elementary, middle, and high school levels, as well as teaching college courses now, um, performing a lot on trumpet, and then ending up working in the music industry. And I've been in the industry since 2013 at this point, so it'll be just right at six years. 
and I've seen a lot of uh, things and learned a lot about how the music industry and music education uh, fit together and where there's opportunity for more learning to happen, uh, as well as how university courses are constructed, how we're teaching uh, uh, future music educators. I also spend a lot of time um, and have a lot of passion for just technology in general and how it affects the way we do things. Uh, so I talk a lot about music technology. In fact, when I was teaching, I started a music technology course, uh, at which time the state of Louisiana had no um, idea of what that was at the state level. So they pushed back and I had to create the course at the state level, which is kind of how I got into all this technology stuff in the, in the first place. So um, my degrees are in educational leadership, um, masters of trumpet performance and uh, education, uh, music education undergrad. And I just love to learn new things and always ask why and think what, why should we be doing this or how should we be doing this today versus the way we've always done it. How dare you be a critical thinker? No way, just critical. And 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 here's what's funny that you you just said that. Um, our our listeners can't see you. Obviously, I. I've met you several times in person and can see you as we're talking. Um, you look like a trumpet player, John. Have you ever been told that? <laughs> what does a trumpet player look like? <laughs> I don't know. But if there was like a picture of the quintessential trumpet player, I think it'd be you. Um, first trumpet player. Just sorry. Oh, first. sorry. Lead. Lead yeah. trumpet player. Just get it. Yeah. <laughs> On yeah. a mouthpiece that's measured in in like micromillimeters. <laughs> yeah. Then a nickel. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so awesome. I'm super, super happy that you are my guest. I've, I've tried for years to get you on. <laughs> Your 65th guest. Coming out there. You're so busy, though. Um, <laughs> it's really great because you've been in the most recent, you know, iteration of the music industry. And I actually started in the music industry. And when we talk about industry, I want to make it clear for our listeners that there's a difference between the field of music education and then all the things that support music education and then all the things that come after music education. That's kind of how it's defined in my mind is industry is everything that's not school music education. And yet it's there to support music education and there to come after your music education maybe is complete. Would you concur with me on that sort of definition? Absolutely. Absolutely. So my first job out of high school was working in the quote unquote music industry. I was hired to work in a music store and I spent six years putting myself through college working at this music store. I worked in music rentals and sales. I helped out in the repair shop. I was the receptionist for a while, which was wonderful. And I eventually rose to the heights of like sales manager and I ran the small goods department and I learned more in about just life and just how business works through living it that way, how purchase orders worked, how invoicing works, how to budget and plan and commissions and receiving and inventory and, and all that kind of stuff, which guess where I was able to apply all of that learning when I got my first teaching job and opened a brand new school to teach band and orchestra. And the reason I wanted to talk about this is because this episode's going to be coming out shortly before the NAM show. And you've been to NAM, haven't you? Oh, yes. Many times. And what do you think of it? Well, I am um, just disclosure. I've been heavily involved in the NAM Foundation and their support music initiatives on the advocacy side. For That's another kind of thing I forgot to mention. I'm the advocacy chair for uh, Massachusetts Music Educators but I've been involved in, in that as well. You know, NAM, as the story I was going to tell is, is, is NAM sort of like when it all clicked together for me. And we, we've already mentioned in this talk already about education, store, retail. You mentioned growth channels of being a salesperson, you're a sales manager. And so I wanted to kind of unpack today, you know, really the, how being a music educator is thought of in a very traditional sense and taught from higher ed, you know, what a music education path looks like and your path to ongoing learning and professional growth and how that compares to the industry and how these things all intersect. And spoiler alert, I'm going to just completely ask people to rethink what these labels are and just think about skills we acquire and actual success metrics. And at the end, I'm going to actually uh, try to compare success metrics in education to success metrics in business and say and show that it's really the same thing. You can see this is the educator in me because I have to like lay out my plan. Is that so if any administrators are listening that I lay out the learning objectives clearly because <laughs> I need to be evaluated appropriately, right? <clears throat> 
Um, but back to Nam. You know, I grew up all I wanted to do was be a be a trumpet player, a first trumpet player, obviously. <laughs> and I um I was doing my doctorate in trumpet. I did, did a year of a doctorate. I just had this thing where it's like I don't want to teach trumpet, um, but I want to play trumpet. So I, I went to start teaching full time. And I taught for six years and I gigged in New Orleans and I thought I had like the life, you know, like that's what you want to do. You want to get a great teaching job and you'll be able to gig in the evenings. And so I'm playing and like I had made it, you know, like 25 year old John is like made it. Um, and then after six years of teaching, I kind of was like, you know what, I want to um, try something else. And technology was really big. So I ended up getting a job at PreSonus Audio. I'd started a music tech program. And I, this was a very interesting moment right before I hit the industry is I was education focused. And at the, there's, there's a whole other piece of my life in here where I ended up uh, chairing the creative arts committee for Louisiana when we won race to the top. This is like 2011. So there was that whole, uh, and so I was had really focused on standards. I had written model student learning targets for the whole state. I was very curriculum assessment rubric focused for sure. And so I was gigging with my buddies at PreSonus being like, Hey, you, your products are great for education. You know, we could do this. What do y'all do for education? They didn't really have an education person. So long story short, I ended up starting, but there's this great story that I remember. I was sitting in my dear friend, Rick Nockvi, who's senior vice president now of PreSolness, and I was I'd presented a plan for what I wanted to do. And they're talking to me about, well, we need a sales channel manager. I said, what's a channel manager? Like the channels on the remote? Like, I don't know that, like what channels? What's a channel I mean, really, they're like, so if you don't like bundles, margin, I'm like, margin, uh, like don't write in the margins. I don't know what you're talking about, bro. Um, so I've submitted my little, you know, what I want to do. I'm like, look, teachers don't care about the blue box. They don't care about headroom on preamps. They don't care about, they, they you know, they, they just care that they, like, they can do something that makes their children successful. And if you could demonstrate that with your products, and I was taking that approach. And I remember I had this report and Rick's sitting there thumbing through it. He says, it's a rubric. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know what? I, I, I love him to death. Wait, wait, wait. Things? Say it again. He said, what's a rubric? Rubric. Rubric, right? Oh, so I, uh, I thought, you know, at the time I said, wow, we are two people speaking two completely different languages. But, and I, I, I love this man to death. And actually we have, a, we have an ongoing tradition of having breakfast at NAMM every year um, on Saturday morning. And we, it's like a big love fest. We always will. And that's one thing about NAMM, about the relationships you build are so amazing. Uh, just truly amazing industry. One thing that I realized is I didn't really know what the heck Rick was talking about. And Rick sure as heck didn't know what I was talking about. But we both were going to take a chance on each other. And it was the industry and education coming together in like a pure, like blind faith moment. Cause I quit my job. I left teaching. I'm doing air quotes. I got to remember that we're on radio, not television. I quote unquote left teaching to take on this whole new role. I had no idea what to do. And uh, the first, I started just, I mean, I, I waited to the end of the semester so I could, you know, have an even break with my semester classes. Started pre this January 2nd. And they said, go to this thing called NAM. We have NAM coming up. This is huge. Big product release. Book your flight to California. I'm like, oh, a conference. I've been to Midwest. I know what big conferences are. And I get to NAM and it is like a whole other world. It's fast paced. It's the entire industry. It takes two days just to go through the exhibit hall. It's just absolutely insane. And I, I remember standing there just looking around like, like the first time, like, Kevin McAllister came up and hunted in like whatever, like New York is looking around. It's all crazy. And it's just, and I remember thinking, why have I gotten through music degrees? How have I taught college courses? And how have I, you know, gotten to this point and never, ever known that this world existed? How is that possible? And it just blew my mind. That, and, and then I was really just grappling with like, wait, there's all these roles, there's the music industry, there's product focus. And then I found the NAM Foundation, which advocates for music education and like my whole world just clicked and I fell in love with Mary Lurz and like everyone does and of course it's like she's amazing yeah I'm like this is this is where I belong you know the whole the whole name organization so from there I just got into this thing of like all right I've got to figure out how you know my experiences relate because at the time I'm like I don't know how to be a channel manager I got to do marketing how do I market products I was doing product bundles I was trying to calculate this margins and other things I was trying to do sales e-blasts, all and I'm like, I don't know how to do any of this stuff. But spoiler alert, as a teacher and someone who had been an educator and someone that actually worked a lot with like data and analysis for, um, you know, like uh, higher ed in that area, I realized that, you know, trying to 
create a good lesson plan, develop a strong lesson plan, and deliver information to a class, constantly evaluating student success informally and formally to get the students to get to a given result. That is sales and marketing all in every. So, and I will like, you know, spoiler alert, like every day at Note Flight, I feel like I'm teaching. What do we need to provide? How do we need to do it? What do we need to make? What do we need to create based on what people are asking us to build? How do we deliver it? How do we explain what it is? How do we train people? How do we adapt for what people need? And how do we measure results based on the success of our customers, which could be students or whatever? At the end of the day, you want people to be successful, whether it's that third grade child, whether it's the composer trying to write something and sell it on note flight. We're just always going to success and then planning carefully and making great plans and expecting to completely let them go haywire when a teachable moment comes up and that's fine, but it's very, very similar, similar paths. And I think we need to stop thinking about it as different markets Mm -hmm. and just thinking about, we use different terminology and we have different paths of education in, in these areas. But at the end of the day, you're delivering information to make somebody successful and you're building relationships the whole time. And I think it's all in the same if you really think about it like that. Yeah. My experience at the NAM show last year was incredible because when you walk around there, you realize that's what your music education was was for. Like not all of your students are going to grow up and become composers or artists or, you know, professional trumpet players or even just look like professional trumpet players. <laughs> I'm sorry, first trumpet players. Thank you. But they could end up being a brand manager for Diderio. They could end up, you know, working in the marketing department for, you know, Sonar. It, it just the the ways that music infiltrates our society is like personified in this show. And it's a show. It's not a conference. The conference bit, the educational portion is is what would you say, John? Ten percent maybe? Right. But most of it is massive booths, try everything out, artists walk in everywhere, it's and concerts, constant music. It's it's amazing and mind blowing and everybody should go. Right. It's about the product industry, right? I mean, that's yeah. the original idea. I mean, before the internet, I mean, NAM was where you went for retail store owners to talk to manufacturers and say, hey, this is what's available. And that's really what it what it was for, is a place to go see new products, meet directly, get in your orders. I mean, there's a joke that NAM stands for not available, maybe May, right? Because there was this rush to like show your product in January, even if it wasn't ready, because you didn't have another chance. And, you know, and NAM still does that. But now we have the internet. I mean, a manufacturer can launch a product with a great series of videos and web tutorials anytime, you know? So NAM is sort of transition. And I, I credit Joe Lamont and the NAM team so much for always being ahead of that transition and adding to the value of the NAM show with educational tracks and AS partnerships and all the NAM foundation part. And like you know, the, the show just keeps growing, even though like really hypothetically, the need to actually go out is less and less because of what the internet offers. But the show keeps growing and it's just a testament to the industry. I really enjoy it from that perspective. I think one thing I've really thought a lot about, even in preparing my brain for this talk today, is that Education. We talk a lot about education as a market. And when you talk to folks in the industry, you know, there's the education market, like a channel manager. You know, you have education, you have worship channel, you have you know pro pro market, you have commercial high end market, you have home enthusiasts. And you kind of break into these little like sales channels that we look at. So there's education as a market that can represent potential buyers, but there's also education as we as teachers think. Like I'm, I learned in music education. My degree is in music education. So we're you know K-12 certified to teach music. Very different things there. But I think about like I think about education or educate as a verb, you know, and that's when I think it's easier to think about what is what does all this mean? Like education as a market, product education. But to educate, I mean, a teacher learns very quickly to be able to break down ideas and say the same things eight different ways because those kids, of course, in education, we've got differentiated instruction. You know, we have our buzzwords. But, I mean, we learn to be able to read a room, look at people's eyes, grab those informal assessments very quickly, and take in information and deliver it so someone can understand it and be successful. That skill is, is so needed, like you said, in, in the industry in general. Every company, whether it's a retailer who's selling products, music store, uh, or whether it's a manufacturer, someone has to explain the value of their product, 
marketing is really about education, just to, with mm-hmm. graphics and, and short text and copy videos. The, the ability to get information out, training, I mean, there's so much education that happens. Actually, it amazes me that my, my biggest challenge at Presol, I had new ideas on how to reach the education market. It was about teaching teachers to record their ensembles. I started there. I said, you know what, if you could record your ensemble, you could immediately play back to students. So instead of me as band director saying, clarinets, you're flat, percussion, you're lost, trombone players, what are you doing, right? Which is pretty much standard. My goal was say, look, you need to like hit, hit play, let your students listen and let the clarinets hear that they're flat, right? And so that they can make the adjustments in real time instead of just doing it because you said so. And so I kind of took this idea, and all of this is on musiced.presonless.com still. It's hilarious. You can see all kinds of crazy videos of me. But I had this concept, like, great, I could go teach teachers this. And now they're like, no, no, no. You have to create a program. You have to educate store owners to get their store employee to educate vendor. I'm like, wait a minute. There's all these, like, steps, you know? And it's like, wow, there's so much education going. Like, as a manufacturer, I have to train all the retailers on how to – teach my product to the customers and there's all these layers of explaining and it forced me to make like materials and better videos and like think about who you're educating so i just realized i had a moment after about a year of being at presonus that i said i am doing more educating at this job than i think i ever did as a teacher all i'm doing is breaking ideas down and trying to explain them and getting feedback and realizing what works and what doesn't The only difference is there's a lot of money tied to the ideas. So at the end of the day, you know, your your money has revenue attached to it. But revenue could also be grades or success of students in that way. But I just think this idea of like if you if you are a music teacher or you have education experience or you've taught private lessons forever and you're that musician wanting to do something, but you don't necessarily want to be in the classroom every day, that you you can't be a teacher, that's completely false. You will teach so much in the industry. There's so many opportunities that for someone who has the ability to educate others and speak confidently and accurately about the value of something. And I think one of the things that teachers bring is is the the value of of talking about something in a use case versus a a traditional product manager that says, now, if you turn this knob, it increases this. And this knob does this. But if you click this button, right, that's product training. Education is that, hey, you want to compose some of this? Let me show you how to do this. You could add this and you're, you know, you're, you're teaching a use case using a product, which is very different. So you've kind of bridged a little bit of the gap as music educators trained in music education. What opportunities are there for us? And, and I want to start this by looking at the opportunities closest to us and kind of working our way out just so that we have this complete view so that if we stay in music education, our entire wonderful, amazing careers, we at least know where to tap into for specific resources. And if we decide that maybe we don't want to stay in music education, our entire industrious career, or maybe we end up retiring and wanting to continue still working in the music field, but not necessarily in the classroom, like you said, that there are those opportunities. I can talk. Look, don't do I'm a first drum player. I can talk. I just look at it like, okay, so here's here's me. The closest music industry thing to me would probably be my local music store. I've been very fortunate to have great relationships with music stores, obviously working with music stores, being a road rep for music stores where I would go out to the remote areas in the state of beautiful Utah. Oh, poor me, had to drive all the way from Salt Lake to Moab and it was was gorgeous. Anyway, you ever, um, tell me your experience with like music stores and stuff. We uh, absolutely. So one of my first jobs in high school was working at a music store, uh, which is great. And they had a, they had a, the hazing for the new guy, the F and G as they called him. Uh, your first role was to organize the sheet music. Now you don't see this a lot in retail, but back in the day, you'd have the singles sheet music. You have like bins for just just football fields of bins, and they have all the little single songs you could buy for three ninety five. You know. And people would pick them up and put them down, and they'd have to be in alphabetical order. You'd have to go through at the end of the night and find all the broken lost stuff and re-put it all in. And then you get it alphabetized, and you realize you're off by a letter, and you have to move everything down a bin for like the whole, like from B all the way to Z. And then you get to H, and there's another new product that comes in, and you have to literally take those music and move everything from H all the way to Z down one 
is in, it take hours. And so everyone, like the guitar players are clocking out and you're still there at like 1130 and everyone's laughing at you. That was the new guy's job. It was the worst job in the store. It's funny because Note Flight finally lost a feature, which is a whole new product in beds. And I kind of laughed. I said, wow, we're like reinventing sheet music online to replace that model now. I'm like, maybe this is my somehow secret revenge for my first hazing and trying to reorganize all the single paper music to to completely reinventing the way we interact with music online so people will just buy it interactively. But that's kind of a funny, like full circle. Um, but one of the things that's been super successful in the local music store, what I finally figured out at, at, at PreSonus and, and, and NoFly too, is the local retailer wants desperately, desperately, desperately wants to serve. In fact, in the retail industry, they call themselves school service dealers. Mm-hmm. That's the term. They're not salespeople to school. They are school service dealers because you ask any of these people, the rover, they are serving schools. They are there to make your life easy. And it's not about selling things. I think teachers sometimes get so nervous about being sold to, like at conferences. I don't want to go in the exhibit hall. Someone's going to sell to me. Y'all, I'll tell you, like everyone listening, put your ears on. No one's making millions and millions of dollars in the music products industry. Okay. You think we like it's we're doing this out of love. We're, we're, you know, like this is a small industry. I think the music product industry is like $17 billion or something a year. Dog food is 96 billion. All right. So y'all like, you think we're not in a very large industry in the grand scheme of things and that's okay. But these dealers want to serve. So as a local teacher, I would strongly recommend that you engage the local dealer and use them. I mean, they would love to host all the teachers in their store for all sorts of different professional development. And that's one thing that we were able to capitalize on a lot. We go to a local retailer, say, like, we're coming in, we're doing a technology professional development. The teachers will come out. Any music teacher knows that one of the things we deal with as music teachers is isolation. We're generally the only person in our school in that area, you know? So we're not, you know, and we get forced in the PLC or the the arts PLC where it's like, okay, math, do this, English, do this, um, band, orchestra, PE, choir, art, y'all go do something. Or ancillary was the worst term. Ever. Uh. Right. But like create this opportunity. The local music store would love to host you. They'd probably even buy donuts and coffee. I'm sure they would. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you know, so if you have an idea, like start teaching others. I mean, I think one thing we forget about music educators that I certainly took a long time to realize is it's not just the students, right? We educate the parents, we educate the other teachers, we educate our administrators. And once you realize that as a teacher, your whole world's up, you know, and, and I, and I'm, I'm pretty adamant about this in conferences. If I'm, if I happen to be out late drinking at the bar at a conference, which very rarely happens, but if it does, you know, and I hear teachers, you know, generally complain, my administration doesn't do anything and my parents don't care. I'm like, well, have you told them, have you educated them? They're like, no, it's not my job. I'm like, all right, hold my bear everyone back off. And I literally love these conversations. I love engaging and say, who says your job is to only educate the student, right? Educate everyone. I mean, you're in this to teach music, make the parents better, make the administration better. You know, it's the same in the retail industry. Like we don't realize as music teachers, how much wealth of knowledge and passion and how valuable we are. We underestimate ourselves so much. So if you as a teacher would just go to your retailer and say, look, I'd love to share this cool thing I have with other teachers. Can we maybe host a, a night where the teachers get together? They would love that, you know, create those opportunities to start teaching and creating this professional development experiences and let the retailers help because they have space, they have funds, they have reach, their road reps are reaching out to the schools. They can help get the information out. It's a great channel to be able to then circulate information and build a sense of community around that local retailer. Well, and if they're a school service dealer, they know everybody else, like you said. And so they also know which jobs are coming open, who's going to be retiring next year. They're going to they're gonna know all of that. You know, who's in an elementary job that really wants a junior high job and maybe you want to swap places. Like they, they have the inside scoop on all of that. Um, my local guy would come out to my school once a week and I'm not that far from the store. I was, I was maybe a seven minute drive from his store he'd still come out and say do you have any instruments that need an adjustment and he'd just do it for me right then you know no charge it's all about the service it's great there, we had a guy uh, in baton rouge on the, in one of the music stores he was the he was the domino the orchestrator of the dominoes and he was you know obviously his business in everyone's business but meaning you know when a music teacher at one of the one of those coveted jobs leaves or retires 
everyone wants it, but then there's this hierarchy where someone's going to, someone's going to take it, but then someone's going to take their job and someone else is going to take their job. And we create this domino effect that we have like six position shift. He would, every time he knew exactly, he'd, he'd call him and he'd kind of like work it all out. And lo and behold, whatever you said was going to happen, happened. Yep. Right. But he put good people in schools where they deserve to be. And he wasn't working for the, the county. He was just working. Well, just a making... lot of a lot of those guys, they, they stay in their music store for a long, long time and they train up their employees to take over after them. So they maybe have seen every teacher who's ever been to your school. So if, if you're starting at a new school, start at the music store and say, you know, what was what was the former teacher like? How were they supported? Because you might discover a lot about your position, too. I think so. And I do think there's just the fear of the music store. I mean, I, you know, I, I do sense that a lot where people really are afraid to be sold something. They think there's some, you know, they're trying to push a product. I really would just, as a teacher, I just would strongly recommend that, yes, they may have great ideas of products. And at the end of the day, their jobs are essentially funded by selling products, but they certainly don't want to give you anything that's not valuable. And they they really want to, to service you. And I've been to NASMD, the National Association of School Music Dealers. I've been to other conferences of school service dealers specifically. And I can tell you, I've been in those conversations with store owners with no one around. And the conversations are always passionate about how to encourage for how to get more students involved in music and how to get more students staying with music. And I think we realize that, you know, education, not just as school, the school market, but education is the future of the music industry, right? I mean, I, I mean, I know that people there to learn music outside of school, but if we stopped having music education, if, if lessons stopped in retailers and we had no music in schools, imagine where we'd be with music in the world. I mean, education is where it is, you know, and I used to say this, I mean, pretty some of us right now, no flight or anywhere else that every single one of our future customers is in school right now, every single one of them. And we understand that. So the more we can do to support music education growth, whether it's in school, after school programs, in-store lessons, whatever it is, it supports the making of music. And that's what NAM truly, truly, truly understands. And I just cannot emphasize enough. That's why the NAM show gives millions of dollars of profit to the NAM Foundation in order to invest in music education. I don't think people realize how much money the NAM Foundation is investing, just like the CMA Foundation and other organizations like that. They invest millions of dollars to support music ed programs. And that's really, really important to remember that the products industry understands that growing education grows all of us. I mean, we are it is a huge circle, right? I mean, we are every every good manufacturer is making products based on customer needs and customer feedback and segmented research. We're making things that people want, but we're trying that that's what we're trying to do, and we're we're adapting those based on customer feedback. And so that alone says that education has to be part of that. So our customers are more educated; they're asking for needs. We're building them. We're educating them how to use it. You know, so it's all one big one big cycle. So if our music store is the thing that's closest to us, we could actually look through all the inventory of the music store and realize that there's an entire company behind that. There are some like mid middlemen distributor type places like St. Louis Music, Harris Teller, Chesbro, um, a Howard lot of them Ford. that order directly from the menu. Did I list enough there? How Leonard distributes. Oh, How Leonard is also a distributor. Thank you. Those are all distributors. So Hal Leonard's a great example, or Alfred, or any of these, you know, that you you would buy directly your music from, but they don't always produce it themselves. They buy the, you know, stuff from the composers or the authors of the books or, you know, the manufacturers of the boomwhackers or whatever. So you could actually work your way backward from there. And if you're if you're a passionate clarinet player and maybe teaching full time in school isn't for you and you have a few clarinet students, but you want to maybe be more involved in the industry, look at how many products are involved in your clarinet. And every single one of them has a monstrous company right behind it. Well, maybe not monstrous. They have a, a company behind it from your reeds to your ligatures, to your mouthpieces, to your barrels, to your instrument, to the case and on and on. You make a really good a really good point about the structure industry. One thing that I, I realized, in fact, the way I got involved with Hal Leonard was through distribution. And, you know, again, being in the music industry, I mean, some of the mammoth companies, your Fender, your Gibson, I mean, they can they can distribute direct to the retail store because they're such a large company and they can manage those relationships. But there's a lot of companies out there that 
that are making great products for, for music, but don't have the sales and distribution or the ability to hold inventory and warehouse to be able to deliver to 3000 different music stores. When you think about how a product gets to your music store, when you want it, there's a lot of things that happen. And one of like, like you said, like the St. Louis music, the Harris Tower, and, and how Leonard took this on a while ago and started distributing more than just music. We distribute about f- over 30 lines of technology. I mean, we have all kinds of music tech things that we just distribute and drums and cymbals. And we actually distribute a lot of products now just because we have an infrastructure to get things to retailers. So it allows manufacturers to focus on what they do best is building great products and not having to also find a way to warehouse and ship to any one of thousands of music stores who might order the product on a day, but they can actually have a distributor handle all of that so they can focus on what they do best. It's actually a need, especially in an industry like this at small. Boom Whackers is a good example. I'm not sure the Boom Whacker industry and who makes them, but you could imagine someone with like some like uh, elementary product, low cost. There's not a lot of margin or, or dollars in that. So you certainly can't run a company and have an entire distribution network, but you can certainly make them and use a distributor to get reach that you wouldn't have as a small company. Mm-hmm. And that's why we see us kind of coming together as distributors who can actually help make music products successful and get them to the right people. So let's talk about sheet music just really quickly here. I know a couple things about that. You know a couple things about that. Uh, Cause I have been looking at this is going to be, I'm going to, I'm going to shorten this story. Um, so my dad, music teacher passed away six months ago or, or maybe a little more. And before he died, he was working on a piece of music, or at least he said he was, I haven't been able to find the file yet where he wanted to arrange some songs for band. So I want to arrange these songs, dedicate it to him, basically finish this body of work that he started but I don't have, you know, I have that strong desire. I probably have the ability there somewhere. And in three or four years, when I finally get it done, how do I get that out into the industry? And I think there are a lot of music teachers who are kind of in that same boat. We might go through Teachers Pay Teachers to distribute a lot of our stuff. And that totally counts as industry work as well. But what what distribution channels are there for somebody who's just a creative and isn't into running the business side of things, just wants to get that product out there? Do you, are you really asking me this question? This is, this is, we, this is not planned at all. This is right. At least there is no, this is not, I planned. can't believe you're asking me this question. I so totally just, just came up with it. Arrange me.com. Arrange me.com is how Leonard's program for allowing you to self publish your music right to our distribution, our online uh, websites. And it's a, original compositions, arrangements of public domain music, as well as arrangements of copyrighted works. So this is something that actually uh, we've been working on extensively and and something I work on um, every single day is the ability to allow composers to arrange a piece of music. We have a pre-cleared list of songs, over 2 million songs that you can arrange. So um, it's all pre-approved. You look in a database, you search your song, we say, yep, it's there. And you can sell an arrangement and it immediately goes for sale. Uh, Right now it's on Sheet Music Plus uh, and Note Flight Marketplace. We are growing this program, and I will, I will let the cat out of the bag on this podcast here. But we are growing this program to very soon. When you sell music on Note Flight as an interactive file or on Sheet Music Plus as a PDF, it will then extend distribution into uh, other sites like Sheet Music Direct, as well as go through you know Hal Leonard's uh, in-store print network and making it available to you know thousands of retailers nationwide. So we're building the ability for anyone to just put their music for sale and we will distribute it out through the same channels we sell our music and allow you to self-publish. Because we truly believe that self-publishing is the next way and we need to find an easy way to make to clear arrangements. And so we've actually done a lot of this legwork and we're working on consolidating this program and growing it rapidly. So you'll see you'll see this roll out in phases and then by mid next year we'll be in full force Go to arrangeme.com, upload your music. It's for sale everywhere. We're even working on like really cool ways to engage sellers with the information we have from just being a historical publisher. Like imagine you log on and see a dashboard and we say, hey, Easter's coming up. Like coral, like sacred coral is hot right now. Get it in. Then by the way, holidays are coming up. We need this type of thing. Or we're finding there's not enough people are searching for SATB arrangements of this song and we don't have enough. So we can actually feed composers and arrangers information about what's needed in the market 
uh, which is exciting. So this is a huge, huge piece of what we're working on now. That is stupid smart. I mean, that is just outrageously cool. Even for a first trumpet player. Even for a first trumpet player. No, it's not my idea. It's something we would mean. So this was a program that was piloted with Sheet Music Plus years ago. And then we started No Flight Marketplace where you can sell your music all as interactive No Flight files. And now we're, we're merging all those together and extending distribution into one large program. But ArrangeMe.com is there right now. It's a, it's a landing page that explains the program and shows you where you can sell. And then that'll just eventually grow and grow and grow. And eventually you'll be able to sign in and you'll be able to see all your sales. And it's it's really exciting. So that's a huge piece of what we're working on. Right? That That is pretty darn cool. You can still be teaching full time and still work in the music industry. Absolutely. No, Nobody says that just because you're a classroom teacher, that's the only thing that you can do and the only creative outlet that you can have. You know, I'm glad you said that because one of the things I'd written down that that just thinking about being a teacher, like a classroom teacher, Versus working in the industry. One thing that I've learned is um, like professional growth, right? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to challenge education a little bit right now. So education, if you're listening, I'm about to challenge you. All right. Don't, don't at me, bro. <laughs> okay. So, but this idea that you're a teacher on day one, you're a first year teacher. And 10 years later, guess what? You're a teacher and you're at, you're at scale plus 10. And then next year you're a scale plus 11. And as long as you are, have a pulse and you still have your license and you haven't been fired, you're, you know, like every teacher is their pay increases the same based. It's just based on how many years you go somewhere else. Your value is just how old you are. It's ridiculous, right? You go in business, I mean, there's experience that matters, but your value, your work ethic, your drive, your ability to manage people, your ability to be visionary, your ability to execute, that gets you promoted. And you mentioned earlier, like, being a salesperson, you can start on the sales floor, then you can promote it to department manager, and then maybe store manager, then you can be a director of this, and you can be a VP of this, and you could, I mean, you know, and it, it happened to me. I mean, I started as music education manager for pre songs and director of education, the director of something at No Flight, the VP of something, and managing director. You, you know, you work really hard, and you bust your butt, and you get rewarded for it. And I, I feel like the whole system of, all right, guys, fill out your PGP for this year. So your professional growth plan for those that aren't education acronyms, you know, like fill out your PGP this year. And this year we're going to focus on differentiated instruction. So make sure we put DI in your PGP. Oh, we also want to do PBIS. Make sure your PGP has PBIS. And right, we're going to get in PLCs to talk about that. And it's like the same sort of monotonous, like, and you feel stuck as a teacher. And I think the system is not fair. And I think we should absolutely revamp education and we should absolutely uh, create it like a model of business where people are rewarded for their efforts and get promoted to success. And But that's a whole other thing that we can talk about. But having said that, the point of my rant is if you're a music educator and you're, and you're there at that five-year mark, that sort of three to five year, like, what am I doing? Is this the rest of my life? Oh, Lord, help me. Like that kind of, which we all feel. But We all feel that. <laughs> oh, we do. We've been there, right? But I would say that you know, your, your success and growth is, is, is up to you at that point. I mean, just because the system's broken doesn't mean we have to be broken. So you, you want to be, you want to promote yourself, promote yourself, get out there and go to your local <laughs> dealer. I mean, make something happen. I call it MSH, right? Make so, something <laughs> and there's nothing stopping you just because the system says you can't, you know, but once you've been teaching for a few years, you want to get out there and start, you know, educating parents, teaching other lessons, selling music, do it, like create those opportunities for yourselves, promote yourself, right? Promote yourself into that. And, and eventually, you know, every, every job I've ever gotten, I was doing the job before I got the title. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's just me or my experiences, but even like just promotion in general, the way I've found to be able to get to the next level is demonstrate you can do that level. Don't ask for it and then do it. Just start doing it. Every single job I've ever gotten, I was doing the thing before I got the title. Because you demonstrate that you can do it and then be like, oh, well, you're basically doing it. So you might as well just, you know, and that's that's important. So as, as a music teacher, I know the system's broken. I know that the level of the way you're promoted, and I know sometimes you don't feel valued from the way the system handles promotion and growth. And that. But you know what? Forget that. You can promote yourself promote yourself. If you're a music teacher listening, ask yourself, what can you do to add value to the world and make a list and do the top thing on that list this month and add the second thing later, but just start doing it. 
But I, I used to add programs or change things up. You know, we have so much more freedom than somebody who teaches math, who's handed the math book and says, here, teach, teach what's in this book. We get to choose our own. Some of us get to choose our own curriculum. We get to choose our own resources. We get to choose our own repertoire. We get to choose when we do concerts and which concerts we decide to do. There is so much freedom out there. We just have to take it. Absolutely. And I think the other thing to remember, and, and one thing that, that's really no different from teaching and, and business and anything like that, you always have higher ups. You always have people you're trying to serve. As a teacher, you have administration and you have students. At the end of the day, the most important thing is those students being successful, valuable contributors to society and, and be musically fulfilled in some way. Like that, that's sort of the ultimate goal. And if you have to play smoke and mirrors for an evaluation, just do it. I mean, every job has that stuff. I mean, you know, so don't get, you know, I know it's frustrating sometimes that administration to understand what we actually do and music adds value and the whole advocacy piece. Trust me, I understand that. And I work a lot in advocacy and I think we should advocate up and explain what we do. But that being aside, every job has the opportunity. At the end of the day, the students are the most important. Same thing in any successful business, right? The most important thing is your customer's happy. And that customer happiness is something we drive here all the time. We want people, you write note flight support and you will leave with a smile. Like as our goal, no matter what you write, and it takes us twice as long to write, Hey, are you doing you want a day? I'm so sorry, this is happening all, but it's so important that people are, people are valued and they have happy. And that's what matters at the end of the day. And you can measure that different ways. I mean, to us, if you buy our product, that's, that's good because you like it and we can use that money to build more stuff. I mean, that's essentially where it goes. We just, the more money we make, the more people we hire, the more stuff we build. It's kind of how we, how we do things. So <laughs> it's exciting. I mean, I uh, say we could hire a hundred developers at note flight tomorrow and we'd still not be, we would have no shortage of things we want to do. Just cool. Like all the presentation features, new things that like people don't even know they want until we build it all kinds of audio, like, oh, I mean, crazy stuff. Like what if AI could just help you compose and recommendations and all the kinds of, but we're just, you know, we're just trying to do as much as we can with what we have and grow that so we can keep going. I went on a quite a rant there. No, you're good. So, so the point is go to the NAM show, go, go to the NAM show, discover what the industry is, what it has for you and what it means for your students. Because you'll look around that show that has 125,000 people there and realize that the majority of them have taken music. They learned it from somewhere. They learned it. They absolutely learned music somewhere, whether it's in a school, whether it's a private instructor, whether now it was on YouTube, whatever it is that you have to learn somewhere. Education drives the entire industry. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and when you go to shows, NAM show or even your state conference, go talk to the people in the industry there. Just walk up and say, hi, I teach this. What is your background? Talk to people. You know, I can't tell you how many times I stand in a booth or our team stands in a booth and people are so afraid to talk to us because they might try to sell you something, right? <laughs> Guys, don't buy anything. Just talk to us. Tell us what, I mean, if you would go up to the industry and say, you know what, I would love this, this product or I need this thing or this is what would make my life easy we can maybe build it. I would go to NAM with just a punch list of everything you want built because you can go to the manufacturers who are building products for music and say, hey, education needs these features because a lot of times the product manufacturers aren't thinking about education. That's one of the fun things I got to do at PreSonus is uh, go in and like bring the edge, like even in the new products they made, hey, would this work in the education market? If so, is there a feature we could add to make it valuable? I'll give you one quick example because I think it's a funny story. We were doing a product bundle for a music lab. We call it the Music Creation Suite. Right before Chromebooks came in, they're under music labs. But at the time, great. So a keyboard, everything, all software, one bundle, fits in, back of PC, blah, blah, blah. So we're looking at new headphone options because the headphones we had were really, really big and made for like, and I was like, these are too big for, um, you know, students. We need some smaller kind of things. So, we ordered like all these different headphones that we're looking at sourcing and, and doing other things. So we had like 10 different options and the audio engineers had sort, sorted down to the last three. And they're like, this one has a little mid range. This one, the lows a little thumpy. It's not quite as punchy. And this one, I think the highs are a little airy. I can't cook my definition on text, you know, all this audio stuff. John, what do you think? I took all three. You know what I did? I grabbed them by the cord and I swung them around like a lasso and I threw them all on the ground. 
And they said, John, what in the hell are you doing? Only one of them still worked. I said, that's the one we need because every damn kid's going to do exactly that when they're trying to lock them up after class. And they all looked at me like I'm crazy. I said, you know what? You're right. I said, you better believe it. You make a product that doesn't, is not durable for a middle school class. You're going to be, your retailers are going to do nothing but returns. You're going to lose your money on one-off like component replacements. Forget about it. Durability in education. They're like, oh my God. But it's, it's things like that, you know, like they need that information and it's super valuable. Yeah. And you'd be surprised when you walk around in the expo at a lot of your conferences that a lot of those people were music education majors of some kind or other, but got involved in the industry maybe sooner, maybe later. They've, they've been there. They've done that. They have experience to share. Absolutely. And again, we're, it's really, we're all in it. Truly, those people at the booths, they, no one is there because they're selling a product. They want to, they want to grow music education. And I can say I've just, I've truly never been in a conversation with anyone in the industry that hasn't ended with, I'm in this because I'm passionate about growing the music industry. And the people in the industry, they get to work on the education side, whether it's educating others or directly with the education market. We understand that we are growing the future of education and it's of music, right? I mean, the future of music making rests in school. Everyone who's under 18 right now will be the future music majors. So we have to invest in them, all of us. And that's really where all of the, the efforts and it goes. And back to NAM, it's something NAM does. The NAM show funds music education. Didn't I tell you this was a great episode? In case you didn't catch it, I am a big believer in making the pilgrimage to the NAM show, even if you can only do it once in your lifetime. It will blow your mind. They add more and more for music educators every year. And like I said, for me, it created a core philosophy as a music educator to train my students to truly love music because they could be doing it for their entire lives. Their career doesn't have to be just playing an instrument professionally or teaching music in a classroom. There are so many opportunities for them in the industry, and they can take them if we instill a love for music. Registration for the NAM show is just $35 for music educators, which means it could be your most affordable professional development option of the year. Thanks again to NoteFlight for supporting this episode. Be sure to check out all that NoteFlight has for music educators, from their free online notation platform to their professional development sessions at your state conference or online at the International Music Education Summit. You can even access John's previous sessions for the International Music Education Summit in the on-demand archives. Visit the Marketplace, the NoteFlight Marketplace, where you can score your next score, or sell your next score. And this podcast couldn't happen without the amazing support of Smart Music and their support for music educators. Not sure how to use Smart Music in your own classroom? Check out their YouTube channel for tons of lessons, tutorials, and testimonials from teachers like you. Thank you for taking the time to join me for this episode and for scrolling down to the bottom of the Music Ed Mentor podcast page in your Apple Podcast app and give us a five-star rating. It's your amazing reviews and shares that help more music educators find this content and these resources, and that could completely change the trajectory of their life and their career. And one final thing. I've been working hard on building a new home for the Music Ed Mentor content, from blog posts to free webinars, publications, and online courses, and links to the show notes for each of our episodes. Go to musicedmentor.com to snag all the yummy content and sign up for the email list to get notified of new episodes when we post them. Remember, you can also find the show notes for this and all of our Music Ed Mentor podcast episodes at smartmusic.com slash blog. You'll also find a ton of great information there. Just enter the episode number in the search box to find the show notes for that episode. Until next time, my dear friend, keep teaching on.